Perfect. Hello and welcome to this EPC policy dialogue. Um, well, I'm Sophie Ponschlegel. I'm a project lead of Connecting Europe and also senior policy analyst at the European Policy Center. And today we're going to discuss the French Council presidency and rule of law, and in particular also Article 7. So this event is a cooperation of the EPC together with Institut Montaigne in Paris uh, in the framework of Project Presidency, which is a joint project to make sure that we follow up on the priorities of the Council Presidencies. And in this case in particular to um, bring together the Parisian policy community with the Brussels policy community. Um, yeah, so this is at the moment the six months where France is at the helm of the Council Presidency and we wanted to look uh, closer at what they are doing in terms of rule of law. Emmanuel Macron, when he presented the priorities, explained that it would be uh, of utmost importance for him to um, safeguard the union's values. Um, and of course, there have been hearings with Article 7 on Poland in February, and there is another upcoming one in May. So this is moving forward, and there will be a rule of law dialogue mid-April. However, as we all know, uh, the Ukraine war came in between uh, mid-February and obviously reshuffled the priorities of the French Council presidency and of the EU as a whole, looking at sanctions, looking at the security architecture, and of course also military and humanitarian aid. So now we are also discussing whether uh, Poland and Hungary will get access to the next generation EU funds um, and whether the conditionality regulation will be put into place or not. Um, and to discuss this topic with me today, I have three speakers. One is going to be a little late because she's still in the meeting, but two are already with me. Uh, I first have Ralf Kessner, who is head of unit justice and home affairs at the General Secretariat of the Council of the EU. And I have Barbara grabowska moroz who is research fellow at the CEU Democracy Institute. And thanks a lot for joining. The third speaker who will join is Gwendoline delbos Corfield, who is a French MEP working for the Greens EFA and also rapporteur on the Article 7 file for Hungary. So quickly on the structure of this event, it's a one hour event uh, because I'm sure you have lots, lots to do on a Monday anyway, uh, but we will uh, first speak a little bit, but there will be enough time for questions from the audience. So if you have any questions, raise your hand or put it into the question and answer and uh, we will, I will have a look and you can speak up. And I see that Wendolin is joining. So thanks for joining us. I already presented you, but thanks for making time to be here. So uh, to start off, uh, I'd like to ask uh, maybe Mr. Kessner, so that Wendolin has two minutes to say hi. Um, what is where are we currently in the processes on Article 7 and the rule of law dialogue? Because it very much depends on the council presidencies whether they want to move forward um, the proceedings and the proce procedures. So, can you maybe give us an update of where we stand and also maybe straight away respond to the criticism that the council is not doing enough? <laughs> yeah, thanks, Sophie. Uh, sure, uh, thanks for, uh, for having me. Um, the first, the, the usual disclaimer, of course, uh, I, I cannot speak on behalf of the Council Presidency. Uh, Clément Boone will do this, I think, very soon in the Parliament. And uh, we are the part of the Council that accompanies the work. That, uh, and I can share, of course, my personal views with you after having now followed these files uh, with my team for, for five or six years. So uh, that's certainly a good moment to, to get back to the rule of law. The, uh, uh, it really has moved to the top of the political agenda last semester, I would say. Uh, the Article 7 procedures, uh, the, the rule of law report from the Commission, uh, and also the conditionality, court decisions. So it's, uh, it, it really has moved uh, really to the top level of uh, the EU's agenda. But it also remains, of course, a highly sensitive issue. Yeah, we should not. Uh, forget that these are uh, all democratically elected governments that we sit, have sitting around the table that have uh, 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 strong majorities uh, in their parliaments and uh, and so the, the, the rule of law action is moving on several tracks i would say in the union and uh, and certainly article 7 one of the, the most visible tracks uh, four debates last year in the council, uh, two under the Portuguese presidency, two under the Slovenian presidency, the Polish debate very much focusing, of course, on the judicial reform, 
um, which means in particular primacy of EU law, uh, the uh, disciplinary chamber, the uh, functioning of the National Council of the Judiciary. While the Hungarian debates would be far broader in the sense that they would also cover uh, non-discrimination issues, they would cover media uh, freedom, uh, so less focused only on the judicial uh, elements and structures. Now, I think I will agree that uh, this is, well, no, not the sharpest knife, but it's in the EU toolbox, uh, to be uh, quite fair. But on the other hand, it's a, it's a, it's a political procedure that is, uh, is not as bad as it seems because of it, it just takes time. Um, it is uh, something that governments take seriously. It sends an important message to the citizens. And uh, ministers do actually spend an amazing amount of time at the moment discussing rule of law issues at the council. Yeah, this is, uh, so this was only Article 7, but there's an addition, there's the whole new rule of law mechanism where we discuss on the basis of the commission report on rule of law things uh, in a horizontal manner, but also uh, in packages of five member states. Now the next uh, debate will be in April uh, under the French presidency where the next batch of five member states will be uh, screened, so to say, and uh, discussed. These discussions get better and better. They, they, they build trust. They are based on a, on a very good commission product. And that's, a, that's an encouraging thing too. And uh, perhaps just finally to mention that the, uh, the, the, the whole rule of law business, so to say, has also received, of course, an incredible boost through the court. You know, the, the, the rulings by the court of justice um, on conditionality, on the, on the disciplinary chambers, uh, Article 19 of the treaty, Article 2 of the treaty. This is constitutional law being, being written by the court, very impressive. And it also reinforces the impression that uh, there are many, many uh, tracks at the moment where this is advancing. Not to say that, and not the least on the conditionality, uh, the last big decision of the court. And uh, so, yes, it has moved to the top of the agenda. There has been a lot of action, not everything as expeditiously as many people will have hoped, uh, but it's there. Uh, it's uh, clearly present. And uh, then I can only agree that, of course, what happened in the last months has again had an impact on, on how uh, things move in the rule of law area. Yeah, this is uh, undisputable. I think that's how uh, politics works, so that everything is connected to everything. It's impossible to work in a, in a vacuum, uh, only in one sectorial area. And that uh, if you are, uh, well, if the union security, uh, let's say European security order is uh, facing an immense uh, threat, all of a sudden, uh, the uh, different arbitrations uh, are being done in a slightly new way. And that is just undisputable, I think. And it, it will just reinforce what, what the union has done all along it's through its life, that uh, when there's a new crisis, we adapt, we adjust, and we talk about it, and we find a new way forward. So uh, I think that is about it for the, for the moment in terms of introduction. If I'm, I'm happy to get back to... Uh, to, to other questions, of course. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kessner. Um, I'd like to go to, straight to uh, Gwendolyn Delbos-Garfield, who is the French MEP working for the Greens FI and Rapporteur on the Article 7 file in Hungary. So maybe I know that the, the European Parliament has been extremely active and you know, pushing for a stronger rule of law portfolio at EU level. Can you maybe give your assessment on where we stand, uh, especially in Hungary and also um, being French, where, where you expect also the French government to move forward more? Yes, um, I will just start to say that I'm very ill, <laughs> so I will cough a bit and, um, and I may be a bit shorter than I would be because my, I, I, I quickly have less brief, breath. Um, well, the, um, where the, there's two things where I will, of course, slightly not agree with uh, Ms. Knesser. Um, the first thing is um, on, on, the, on the quality of the tool itself, which is, um, I, I really have this, in, I, it fascinates me how this tool is, is um, always the one that you need to say that it's not really good, um, but the others are, which I, I don't know. Um, I, I don't see why, honestly, because infringement procedures 
um, are useful tools, but we are also always answered by the commission that um, it's uh, they have to be very short. It's very it is it has to be very big, very serious legal basis. And once you do get infringement procedures, you uh, have the problems. Will they activate anything? Uh, in the Polish example, it is. I mean, they just not paying the 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 huge. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm really not finding my words today, but the, the huge um, penalty they are supposed to pay. Uh, so, OK, we've made an infringement procedure. And then you have the rule of law conditionality mechanism. But this rule of law conditionality mechanism has been written in a way which uh, really uh, narrows the scope very, very much on how it can be used. Uh, and there again, we can see in a moment like this one, in, the, in a crisis time, that um, it's, it's no more miraculous than another tool. Uh, the political situation has an impact on the fact that we are not using the rule of law conditionality mechanism today for Poland. Uh, because we have a crisis on the other hand with the Ukraine situation. So I don't see why particularly Article 7 is the worst and why it is the one that is more political or more weak or I have not seen that. And I always say that it's the complementary tools, is that all these tools in a complementary way that works and I still go on with this and, and I think that it's a bit each institution saying the tool he has in charge, um, oh, my tool is not that good, but the other tool is better, which helps, of course, to say that you have difficulties to act. The truth is council and commission are, and that must be said in a difficult situation because indeed Europe is a, 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 not a mature democracy. And, and that means that the, the weight of the, the member states is still very big and, and it is, very, very difficult to put punishments or sanctions or something on one member states. And there, that's why all tools um, are under threat at various moments, depending on the situation. Once it will be the European budget, another time it will be something else, climate goals. Um, and then today it's Ukraine. And, and I can understand it. Um, we just have to be serious about all of them and, and try to go on anyway. Um, where we stand is, is not too bad. Um, when um, I, I uh, started my, my term as an MEP, um, Article 7 seemed really to be, um, procedures seem really to be um, isolated completely. Yeah, people seem to have not forgotten about it. And then, the, I, as I always said, the, fin the Finnish presidency put it back on the table. And since then, there has been a number of member states um, that have been working seriously on this. And these last months, I would, before the Ukraine situation, I would have even said that for the moment, I was uh, more amazed by the council and the situation of the Article 7 procedure than the commission, where really uh, in a number of cases, I didn't understand why um, there were no infringement procedures in what seemed to be very easy situations. Um, um, and we were really hoping to, I mean, the, the word recommendation was out there. It had never been there before. The idea that they would manage to do recommendations all together was one first step. The idea that they had to do hearings every time, um, you know, they, they, they knew that it, with Slovenia it would be difficult, but then they would sort of engage all the others. So the French would do hearings, then the Czech, then the, um, the Swedish, and then we would really push the process, have these recommendations, and you know, go further and further and further. Now, of course, um, I am I, I I am in a moment. In fact, this meeting is happening in a moment where it's very difficult to be very clear about something. Um, um, what? How are the permits going going to go on working on this? I do not know. Uh, it is very clear that the Polish government. Um, as one in this uh, Ukraine situation, um, a forgiven, for, forgiveness moment, um, and they have won a, a, yeah, a moment of, of indulgency and, and they can wait uh, with all the reforms that they, they should be doing on, on the judiciary thing. Um, Hungary is a bit out of the radar, so we don't really know how Commission and Council are um, 
positioning themselves. Uh, of course, Orban is not like um, the Polish government being clearly outspoken against Russia. He is not also clearly welcoming the uh, refugees. So he's not um, helping his, um, his, his situation. Um, and, and so it doesn't seem that there's been a move on Hungary. It seems that we are at the same place. Um, Hearings are foreseen by the French presidency on the 30th of May. Um, this is um, what I am for the moment um, hoping, more than hoping. I mean, I, I understand these hearings will be done for Hungary. And so I still, yeah, I am in this situation and I'm still wanting to, to work with the permits to go further and further every step for this Article 7 procedure, but we in a bit of a mystery moment. Thank you so much. Uh, interesting to see that it's a, it's a mystery moment. And thanks for joining despite being ill. Um, we'll try to keep it short. And uh, now on to Barbara Grabowska Moroz, uh, who is a researcher at CU Democracy Institute um, in Budapest. And uh, she focuses on, on Poland. But maybe do you want to give me your assessment of uh, the French Council presidency and what they're doing until rule of law? And also maybe looking a little bit also at the current discussions around the NGU recovery package and Poland, um, maybe to give a, a quick update on that. Um, I mean, starting from what is written on the paper, so from this program of the French presidency, it seems that um, the Article 7 procedure is not the first thing they have on mind when they think about the rule of law. It's the rule of law report and then the dialogue based on it. So they, I think, trying um, the, the, um, the presidency is thinking about how to use this uh, instrument to sort of um, strengthen the, the dialogue itself because the dialogue so far has not uh, um, present any um, meaningful outcomes. I think it's even less visible than the Article 7 procedure itself. When it comes to the hearing about Poland held in, in February, nothing new has been said, either by the Commission nor by, by, uh, by the Polish government. Yes, the Commission provided updated update about the, the situation of the judges that are being suspended by the disciplinary chamber that should be, uh, I want to say, destroyed, or that needs to be uh, cancelled and, um, uh, and the, the ruling needs to be implemented, uh, the ruling of the Court of Justice. Um, and they even mention, uh, I mean, the whole procedure is taking place for four years already, no outcomes whatsoever. And we still hear the same argument about the judges of the Constitutional Tribunal, that they have been elected lawfully. We already know it's not the case, but the arguments being presented uh, uh, all the time. So I'm just wondering whether it really builds trust a situation when you, you confirm the whole arguments that have been quashed by international uh, courts and many other expertise bodies. Um, and it brings me to a conclusion that when it comes to Article 7, so far dialogue has not been given uh, results and tools. It cannot, it, it's not be able to fight backsliding, I think, at least for the last four years, it was not able to do so. Um, Probably it's also because of the energy of this uh, this procedure. So it's it's not that does not create a situation that you can impose some kind of pressure on, on a member state without saying something about sanctions. Apparently, the court procedure is well fit or better fit um, to achieve such um, such um, such a result. When it comes to the role of the presidency during that hearing, it was really minimal, meaning it, it formed about the procedure, it informed about COVID. And they concluded that the, 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 the problem will be stay on, 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 on the agenda. I think that much more discussions are being um, um, held or decisions might be taken outside the Article 7 procedure. So exactly when it comes to, to funds, when it comes to the recovery funds, the Commission has not um, didn't give a, a green light I, neither for, for Poland nor for, uh, for Hungary when it comes to access to the funds the fines uh, that are being imposed on Poland by the Court of Justice are not being paid. If I'm correct, right now it's about 150 million euros. If they're not going to do something, they're going to lose any kind of you know, EU funds with, with this um, money being, uh, being um, 
uh, impose on, on them. The, the Commission is about to deduct the money from, from, the, from the EU funds, but we are still waiting for the decision. And the conditionality mechanism, despite the, 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 the ruling, despite the guidelines they have that have been also um, uh, published, nothing happened on this respect. But at the same time, we have also a discussion about a special fund for migrants and refugees from, from Ukraine. And, and we all see that those money will be most probably very much needed on, on the ground, both in Poland and Hungary. But the question is, can you give money uh, for migrants when you don't give money for the recovery? Uh, after post-COVID uh, recovery. I think this is the major challenge that the Commission is, uh, and, and the Council as well uh, is facing at, at the moment. But objectively speaking, there is really nothing that stops Polish government, Hungarian government to, to receive those funds, meaning they have to implement the rulings, they have to meet the, the criteria um, uh, in the European semester, and the funds are available for them. Of course, there is no political will uh, at the moment. Thanks a lot, uh, Mrs. Gabowska Moros, for, for giving us this, this overview of like the different options that are at hand. Um, don't hesitate to ask your questions and just putting it there. I'll, I'll ask a question and then we can come to the audience question. Um, we've seen that there are several different options on the table and maybe I think that uh, it was Mrs. Del Bosco field who said that um, you know, each institution says that it's not really the most efficient tool they have at their hand and like to push it to the other institution. My question would be, in view of the current situation that we face, and we've seen that rule of law is not that much of a priority because it's a domestic internal EU issue and that now we need to be united against a Russian aggression in Ukraine. Um, is this really going to hurt the current rule of law procedures that we see? Um, and what could be a way politically to get out of this? Uh, that would be my question. And I'll start maybe with the, the person who's sitting in the council. Yeah, that, that's the one million dollar question. Um, uh, uh, I think uh, uh, the union has always, uh, well, we have lived through, I think, at least six, seven crises in the last 12 years, starting with the financial crisis, the um, euro crisis, migration, uh, COVID. Uh, it's, it's clear that the governments sitting around the table, they, they try to find, find workable solutions um, when the time is there to find them, and uh, and uh, in the case of uh, rule of law, I think they they are also fully aware of it, of the need to act, and uh, and of the uh, I think the framework has now been established. However, it's also difficult to say, oh yeah, now you still have to um, uh, go full speed ahead on 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 uh, let's say the rule of law file while you have. Uh, at the same moment, a uh, government that has two million refugees uh, on its ground and has to, to, to spend billions to, to somehow uh, make sure that these people get, uh, get the humanitarian assistance they deserve. And uh, so, so I think the, the, the important thing is that in, at least the direction is clear. Also in the medium term, the direction is very clear. And this has been again reinforced by the court ruling on conditionality. Yeah, no, you cannot, if you don't respect the, the Article 2 values, you basically are not entitled to the rights of the union. But this does not necessarily mean that at each moment this uh, leads to the same uh, outcome of an arbitration. Yeah, I think at the moment it is uh, coherence and consistency of the EU policy overall is also something that matters. Uh, something you work governments work hard to, to, to establish and to continue. And uh, I, uh, yes, I think what is at the moment is important is that at least in the medium term, we know where this is heading. But I'm, I, I fully realize that this is also not fully satisfactory. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Kessner. Uh, on to Mrs. Del Bosco Field. Um, yes, I mean, of course, there's a, a real danger, but it's, it's, I would say it's difficult to, to predict as um, only going one way. It could in fact be bouncing the other way. Um, so a, a few remarks. Uh, anyway, um, things are in the hands of those people in the grounds also today. And um, Sunday, uh, be it the Ukraine situation and the war, um, if Orban stays in place, it's dramatic 
for European Union and it was before the Ukraine situation. And if he doesn't, well, there's a hope. But I mean, I'm, I'm, I mean, I don't, I don't see things any, you know, in an, in another day, way. And and even if he, he, he doesn't stay in place, it's still going to be a lot of work on Article Seven. And hopefully, my task and the task of the Council and others will be easier because it will be government, and uh, we will feel um, empowered to be difficult. In fact, it's it's quite a paradox. But if if we do have a government that wants to work, then we suddenly we will feel that we can do things. Um, so that's why even if on, on Sunday evening, Orban um, is no more there, uh, officially at least, um, there, there will be a lot of work on Article 7 procedure because what has been installed as a second state since months and months and years is huge. Um, in these last months, a number of high level jobs have been changed in, at the very last minute um, independent, so supposed to be independent bodies, so that you know these people go on for a new term of six years, nine years. So anyway, and and of course we, I hope everyone knows about these new trust and this new system that they created to put universities and and a number of other structures in the hands of the private in a very opaque way. So anyway, there will be work, and anyway, what happens on Sunday is crucial. Uh, be it the, the, the war or not. Um, then also, I think that uh, the situation um, in Ukraine and the, and the, the way we, we, we dealt with Russia these last years can also be an alarm for a lot of people um, about what is happening in Hungary and Poland. Of course, the first um, in this first moment, there was a sort of solidarity between everyone, and, but I think that the Baltic countries and the Nordic countries will be even more uh, worried and concerned about the situation in Hungary if it, if it persists in this way than they were before, because now they see that, you know, um, it, it has effects. Uh, they were already, they were already the ones pushing a lot, but maybe we will have, for example, the Baltic countries have been always very sort of we will not be nasty with the Hungarian neighbor because it could be turned back on us. And now, you know, they may be thinking, you know, once you let something slide back that too much, then you get it back. So I'm, I, I think it's difficult to predict. I also think, and, and uh, we should say this much more louder, that um, it is very clear for a lot of people, um, and I've been listening to high level people uh, talking, um, the, the refugees are not welcomed by the governments. They are welcomed by the people. And, and I've heard uh, Biden and others saying, you know, we thank the people of Poland for welcoming all these refugees because it's not the government that is doing the job and everyone knows that. Um, but it should be said more also in our more internal discussions in Brussels bubbles because it's a bit shocking in fact. Um, and in Hungary, it's even worse. Um, and uh, the, the question for the money on the refugee, for example, has been a real question in parliament for nearly all groups. You know, okay, we will be, commission is going to give this money. It's needed, yes, it's needed. But if we give it to the government, will it be used by the, for the refugees? Will it be seriously used? And if it is misused, what monitoring will we have of the situation? Because they've known nothing about the judiciary. So in parliament, for example, we have not lost anyone. And that I think is very interesting. Those that represent the citizens, um, they have not moved. Uh, and, and I would even say that uh, some people in EPP are getting more and more strong in the, on these questions. Um, and and they, the resolutions, they have not weakened and all of this. So the, the, it is not in the parliament, no one is saying, I mean, no one, apart from two groups, but even in one of them, it's, it's more complicated than that. No one is saying, you know, we should now uh, forget about everything uh, because of this situation. Uh, my shadows, for example, they understand that we need to pursue on Article 7 procedure, even in EPP, even in Renew. I mean, in those um, groups where people are in government and acting at the moment. So, so I think that it's not that bad uh, but it's, there again, very difficult to predict. Thanks a lot. Also good to see that maybe it's not only negative, but it could also like mid, mid to long term have other effects. 
Uh, Mrs. Grabowska Mora, same question to you. How do you see it maybe in the short term, the effects, and also more long term? Mm -hmm. um, I just realized that in the in the first part of uh, now our first um, question, there was um, forgiveness moment used as a term, but also mystery moment, and I also saw positive momentum in one of the of the press releases about this, the current situation. And to be honest, I don't see it as a kind of positive or forgiveness, but a kind of a moment of truth, at least for the for the Polish government. You know, they've been warned for many years that they should not be having. Uh, fight with the EU about the values because one day they're going to need those values. They're going to need the EU support and EU protection against exactly some sort of enemy. And right now, this is the moment that the enemy uh, is present, is out there, is very close, um, and, and such support is absolutely um, uh, needed. So, uh, bearing this in mind, I think uh, it should give the, 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 at least the Polish government um, some sort of additional argument to find a solution of the, of the current problem, but apparently this is not the case. And I'm, I'm not able to say um, uh, or, or predict how the EU institutions should, um, um, should behave when they see that the government is really unwilling to change anything. Yes, this is the same case with, uh, with the Hungarian um, government, but also this argument that we are waiting for elections is still present, so probably no decisions will be taken uh, until that moment. And again, we don't know what the outcome will be, what kind of, um, what, what climate for the discussion will be after, um, after the, 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 the elections. I think what cannot be done is um, changing uh, the, the um, changing the decisions that have been already taken only because of the, of the of the current situation in um, in Ukraine. So there is this this argument which is um, uh, framed as not now argument that this is not right not right time to discuss rule of law because we have more important issues. This is totally domestic perspective about um, uh, about the current um, situation. But I I think that if if not now then the whole idea of exactly giving uh, special funds for helping refugees who absolutely need the, this kind of support will be just giving money and saying goodbye to them because not, we don't know what, what might happen with them, whether they'll be um, executed correctly, whether they're gonna be spent in, in, a, in the right way. I think it's much more obvious, this argument is much more obvious in the Hungarian situation because of the whole corruption system that exists there, but it's not that obvious in, in, in Poland when, when the judge can be suspended because of this decision he or she makes um, and the decision is taken by illegal, uh, the illegal chamber. Thanks. I have two questions, and if uh, they want to, um, well, well, ask the questions live, uh, they should. So the first is Cecilia Vito de la Basti. So if you want to speak up, please go ahead. If she's there. No? Ah, yes. You're still muted? No, I think I'm here, but actually there was, uh, I think, a problem with the name uh, about ah, okay. which account asks question. Okay, so, I'm not so Cecilia, present, obviously. present yourself and ask the um, question then. Yes, so my name is Maxime Guerrou. I'm also working for um, the Institute Montaigne. And so I had the question about um, the political uh, impasse uh, representing, that is representing by Article 7. Um, and uh, we are seeing that there is like um, many action brought in front of the court of justice. And uh, my question is, are we witnessing um, judicial, judicialization of the rule of law issue uh, within the EU? And um, on that subject, I would also ask if it was possible to bring an action for failure to fulfill obligation on the basis of uh, Article 2 uh, TU uh, in front of the CGU. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. And I'll take the second question, which is from Katalin Halmay, if she's there. Yes. Hello, do you hear me? Yes, very well. Uh, sorry, I am on my way, so it's a little <laughs> bit complicated. I am on, 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 on the street, but uh, thank you for this opportunity. Um, I just wanted to ask that, uh, this, the current situation between Hungary and Poland, I mean, how much strain does it have on the Hungarian and Polish relationship? I mean, the war in Ukraine. And do you think it, it will have an impact also 
um, in the Council. I mean, uh, Poland moving out behind uh, Hungary in the Council, um, which would make the decision making process in the Council more easier when it comes also, of course, Hungary. Thank you. Thanks a lot for, for these, these questions. And maybe I'll start the other way around this time. So Mrs. gabowska Moroz, if you want to start off, please go ahead. Um, okay, so starting with, with the first um, question, I wouldn't call it a judicialization, I would call it operationization, if there is a word. So to make Article um, Article 2 and, and the rule of law more operational and being possible to implement it, uh, still indirectly meaning through article 19 so we're kind of you know looking for other uh, ways to to go that way um on the one hand it's kind of it was kind of a revolution now it has been implemented for a couple of in a couple of cases so it's not nothing uh, nothing new but i think um it, it's a natural process that ha had to take place uh, because of the of the lack of the decisions on on a political level if if uh, Apparently, rule of law does not like uh, vacuum situations, and then they ha something has to exist, something has to come up. So I think the court just had to enter the, the stage sooner or, 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 or later. When it comes to article, uh, the second question, so whether you can, whether article two is justiciable, uh, yeah, the discussion is ongoing. Uh, there were many arguments. This is not the case. It's too vague. Um, you cannot make action based on that. But I think it's possible to frame, um, um, and, and we argued it with, uh, with um, Dmitry Kochanov and Kim Shepala, that it's possible actually to frame a case, but on a very broad um, basis, both legal and factual to frame that there has been a violation of, of the values and those that the violation is systemic so it's, it's a much broader job that has to be done and as we heard before commission prefers you know very narrow cases clean clean cuts easy win uh, so this case i think it would be possible but it it requires much more work to be done by um, by the Commission. And the second question, as far as I know, the Hungarian-Polish Friendship Day that uh, was on Thursday, there was supposed to be some kind of official, you know, events and all of them has been um, either postponed or cancelled. So on a, on a very short term, we have, we can see already the, the, the change. Uh, and when it comes how we can affect the voting in Council, I can imagine this argument can came up, um, uh, come up in the discussion between the Polish and, and Hungarian governments in, in the nearest future. Thank you. Gwendolyn uh, delbos Yes, um, I, I understand the word judicialization because it's, it's something that I, um, I, I in fact um, see not as a very, um, good issue, a uh, good um, way of going. I mean, it sh there should be some, but indeed, it seems that n n nowadays there's sort of a, everyone relying on the CGEU to solve the problem at the very end, um, which has a, a few um, flaws. The, the first one I want to say once again is that from time to time, the infringement procedures comes from the commission indeed, but a lot of times it comes from the NGOs. Um, NGOs have been since a decade in Hungary and, and uh, a bit less in Poland, but very active in Poland, they have been bringing cases. Um, and, and, you know, we have been basically relying on the work of these people uh, to do sometimes the work that our institution should have done. That's one thing. The second thing is that um, I don't think that a political uh, a healthy democracy can work only with justification. So this is really an issue at one moment when this is everyone sort of um, 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 uh, outweighs solution is, oh, well, we'll go to ECGU and then she, ECGU will say, and ECGU does say indeed. And, and as it was said, it's very precise cases. It's, and, the, and it's, so, I mean, there's never been a, a loss, a bit on the commission, bit from the NGOs, they have won every cases. Sorry, but what did it change? Hungary has not changed one thing from all of these infringement procedures um, when CGU did state about it. Um, in some cases, they said they would change, wrote a, a paper that clearly hasn't changed anything. And so we are starting the process all over again, saying the new thing that they are proposing is still not complying. Um, in other cases, they have just ignored it. 
um, and basically, you know, uh, be it, uh, you know, on, on the, on the, the there, were, there were cases on refugee situation because as you know, they, they starved people at one moment. There was, there's also, of course, all the big issues of um, attacking the NGOs and doing a lot of rules about NGOs and how NGOs should be getting funding that was completely out of scope of the European law. And all of this was one, but they, they haven't moved what they're doing and NGOs are still having problems today in France, in Hungary and being seen as foreign um, interference and, and blah, blah, blah. Um, on LGBTI, I mean, they have not changed um, and in Poland the same. So um, yes, we won and yeah, and then. Um, so we, we, we do need the politic. Um, it's, it's, it cannot be only politic and it can only not only be activism, but, but, and you need judiciary, but you need all of these components because if not, it's not going to work. And um, uh, should we bring action on failure? Um, maybe, um, yes, there's, there's the, all the discussion on the legal point, um, indeed. I, I've been wondering, you know, what could be done, uh, but I do think that at one moment there will be a need for citizens to go in front of the two main institutions and say, you are not doing your job. And maybe you have a lot of problems about it. You know, it, you have a lot of handicaps, but this will not be sufficient. But to be clear also, I think that failure will come from itself. I often give this example, a lot of judiciary cooperation today, very strong cooperation uh, between member states is in danger because of the Hungarian um, um, uh, situation and it will become more and more if Orban stays in place. There will be people saying, and the same for Poland, there will be people, judges everywhere in Europe saying, I'm not going to work with these judges because they're not independent and these are not my values. And there's a number of other topics, but we'll, we'll see that the problem will come back and come back and come back. Um, and on Poland, Hungary, I mean, we've always um, used, of course, the, the false friendship that they have. It has always been a false friendship. It's two different situations. In fact, um, it, it, it means the same for the citizens' everyday life. But in fact, it's two different situations. Um, and and they um, they are allies when needed, but they they are not the day after. And we have always, I mean, me, we in Parliament, um, the member states in Council, Commission, they have always we have always used this discrepancy uh, to get things. Um, and basically, uh, indeed, for already a few years, it has become to isolate um, Orban, which was not the case at all three years ago. Three years ago, the bad one was Poland and uh, Orban was an EPP, Fidesz was an EPP and all of this and Orban would be still the one you would work with and trying to isolate Poland. Since um, 2019, in fact, um, it has become the country. Um, and of course this situation, I think will uh, exacerbate this where there will be an isolation of Orban uh, because he's not very clear on Putin and Russia and he's not, making any effort on a number of topics is not even trying um, and uh, sadly it could have the default that everyone is happy to go against Hungary um, or the Hungarian government sorry because Hungary is not the Hungarian government um, and uh, letting a number of things happen in Poland uh, because they are very much needed at the moment. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Also a good reminder that, for instance, the European arrest warrant might not work out. So an erosion in the long term might really um, have some effects. Now to Mr. Kessner on some of the three questions you're welcome to choose. Uh, thanks, Sophie. Yes. Um, there's one on the, on the court's role. Yes, I, I agree. The solution will not come from the court alone. But at the same time, this is an area that was almost uh, uncharted territory in legal terms uh, five, six years ago. And now we have, uh, we have uh, seen how, how, how the court can, can uh, use the space that has been given by the treaties to establish certain principles. And, and uh, that is something that all institutions need also to, to take forward their work. So um, I think, uh, in fact, this has been extremely useful that the court has uh, entered the debate has, has, has looked at the treaties and has said, oh, here's what 
what you can do as a national government and here's what you cannot do as a national government under the treaties and then uh, ultimately yes the union is a value is a union of law and so um, so yes absolutely vital i think that the court has uh, has used this opportunity but i also agree ultimately the solution will be uh, political it will not be uh, in a court judgment mm -hmm. um, Yes, then uh, Article Two. Uh, that, I think that's future music. Uh, I think what is more more important is that the court has said you, the, that this is a way that is uh, that the union uh, operates, and uh, and as a result, uh, this will now trickle down. I think into legislative discussions, uh, and uh, let's see what it will bring. But uh, the 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 real news is that this principle has been established by the court uh, by the under the treaty and after article 2 so, so that is already quite a lot uh, i don't think you can get go immediately now to the court and uh, try to enforce it um, in a legal action to uh, yeah poland hungary i will uh, from our experience in the council it's almost it's well it doesn't make so much sense to look at a bilateral relationship when 27 member states are constantly trying to somehow reach majority uh, lines of action on difficult issues that are all interrelated and ultimately they uh, ultimately what drives government's decision making is where are my interests because i need to be reelected and and uh, it's on this basis that they will uh, decide which position they take on questions related to energy to sanctions to refugees to security uh, to trade and and so um, uh, there, there's not. Uh, I don't think there's a single bilateral relationship that is so uh, uh, overwhelming that it, that it simply simply uh, simply uh, puts all the other interests uh, aside. You know? So I think uh, experience rather shows you, the 27 are trying to constantly to arbitrate and find the right balance uh, of their interests in the first place. Um, well, thank you very much. I think it's also a good reminder that national interest prevails in the council and that therefore we also need to take into account national public opinion. I have one last question before I would end this round and it's uh, Frédéric Borg from the College of Europe. So if you want to ask your question, there are two questions uh, live, please go ahead. Can yeah. you hear us? Yes, perfect. Yes, I think now, now I can hear you. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, many thanks to the distinguished speakers uh, for the great contributions. Um, my uh, two questions would be, in short, uh, one regarding uh, the liberation of uh, recurrent resilience funds um, uh, by uh, the Commission. So, like to green light um, the um, uh, plans of, of Poland and Hungary uh, that have been so far uh, suspended um, in light of the uh, uh, evolutions in the Ukraine. So my question here would be, <clears throat> what would you uh, expect um, or, or would you expect an actual cash flow in the short term or the long term? Because there's a little bit of a discussion ongoing that there might be milestones that Poland and Hungary will not meet. Um, yeah, just a general uh, um, question on, on your expectations. And the second question, if I may, would be, um, to the practical impact uh, of these um, new rule of law conditionality, um, yeah, which is uh, by some seen as some sort of a game changer, but um, at least here at the college in the debates we're uh, having, we're um, a lot of people more uh, skeptical if this would be a, a, a nice tool to um, yeah, protect rule of law as it's Mainly, maybe mainly related to uh, protecting the EU budget, as it might be uh, take a long time to um, uh, applicate it. We, we need cases, and um, the, the Commission has to prove um, uh, an, an impact of rule of law violations on the EU budget, and so on and so forth. And my uh, question would be, uh, what, what would be your view? Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Two very important questions on the recovery plans and on the conditionality mechanisms are really, uh, well, current at the moment. So maybe to start off with uh, Mrs. Del Bosco field especially on the conditionality mechanism, maybe. Well, yeah, in fact, that's not the one where I will have the most to say. On, on Hungary, um, we, I don't think there has, uh, a lot has happened. Um, um, Orban made a, 
an announcement that he was going to ask, uh, but I don't even know if he framed it clearly for the moment. On Poland, uh, the discussions are engaged very clearly um, and commission is committing to give some money at the moment. Um, and, and how quick it will be, I don't know, but I, 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 they, they do want to be quick. Uh, they say that they have uh, got um, in exchange for that, the end of this famous disciplinary chamber. Um, it seems that it's not exactly that. And even if they did get that, it's um, not uh, at all uh, accompanied by the fact of uh, reinstalling all of those that have been um, um, thrown out, all these judges. And, and uh, you know, we, we, we had uh, uh, made a big account of that uh, a few months ago, but in fact, in these last weeks, and I, I guess this is more, Kaprovska Moros can say more about this, there has been sort of a, a uh, in fact, an acceleration, and there have been a number of judges in these last week that have had problems. Um, so this is not at all uh, uh, an acceptable situation, but the commission is still saying that they, at the moment, have not basically other choice. And uh, they understand parliament is not going to like it, but that's the fact. On Hungary, I really don't think that much is going to happen for a moment uh, because of the election, because uh, Orban is not clear on what he wants, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The, the situation is of course also less difficult. I mean, it is difficult, but there's not as many refugees as in Poland. So I think in Hungary for the moment, um, things are going to be blocked for still a bit. Um, on the second situation, I'm, I'm, I'm really, when I'm going to say what I'm going to say, I want to say that I'm in a very minoritarian, this may be not so a, a good word, but I'm, I'm one of the only ones saying this in parliament and in general. So yes, this is my opinion and you have to take it like that because it's not the best. I have never thought that this conditionality mechanism was a game changer. I think that the institutions love to create new tools um, and sometimes they should, you know, be concerned about using the ones that they have already created and that they really put them in movement. Um, and, and this is really one of the big problems we have in a number of topics. In fact, that we are creating new things all the time. And, you know, sometimes we should also be sure that we enforce those that we already have. Um, I think, anyway, um, this rule of law conditionality is a good starting point, but it cannot be a game changer now. Indeed, because of this very narrow definition that you have to show, clearly show that the rule of law um, deficiency has a direct impact on the, European, the way the European money is used. And this is already very complicated. Um, and then of course, there's all of these political threats that come uh, on it. For example, on Hungary, we were always always since the very first day told by the commission they had a ready made case no problem they wanted the the judgment from the court of european justice they didn't want to to do it before it was already a problem because on other uh, laws uh, we do it we do it bef if if a member state attacks something we start doing things sometimes before the court of european justice uh, makes a statement, but they said, okay, on this, it's so sensitive, we will wait. But the day we have the, the green light from the Court of European Justice, no problem. We have already made case on Hungary. Hungary is one of these member states where it is going to be easier than others because we have this very clear corruption aspect and all this. Okay, that's what we have always been told by free commissioners. And they even said it publicly in, in newspapers and all of this. And then now they are saying, oh, in fact, we're not sure we do have a case ready. Um, so, you know, the political situation has exactly, exactly the same um, um, implication on this tool than on another. It, it's, it's a complete um, um, a fantasy to think that one tool will escape this. Uh, we need political engagement in all of this. We need our democracy to be more mature. We also need probably to get out of unanimity, honestly, because until we have member states that are all, um, uh, you know, uh, at the neck of the other for anything. And, and, and I, I mean, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to be looking like the one to criticize others and, and not mine. I mean, I, I, if tomorrow we had a, 
a green uh, chief, someone in one of the member states, this person would maybe tell me, you know, well, come on, you know, they're putting in danger climate targets. And it's, it's, the, it's the destiny of the world here, of the humanity. So, you know, we have to do something. Okay, we will, we will, we will postpone it. There's always a very good reason. I'm not saying that the reasons are not good. I'm saying that unanimity is tying us, our hands. And I, so this tool is, is a tool like the others that can be interesting if we do all the puzzle and if we have political will. Thank you. Also an interesting perspective on conditionality mechanism because it has been in fact seen as something where you can change and a good reminder that politics do play, does play a big role. Um, Mr. Kessner, and then I'll come to Bauer. Yeah, just very quickly, I think on the on the uh, recovery fund and uh, the money to Poland, I I think if the decision is green lighted, then we you just first have to look at the details of the decision. Yeah, whether milestones are in there or not. Uh, if if uh, uh, I think the, if anything, the last weeks have just shown how how complicated it is with all these different conflicting uh tracks uh, happening on the ground to, for the commission to take a decision on this yes but uh, but i i uh, think if once the money once the decision has been taken and uh, you have to and the milestones if there are any have been fulfilled well then the money will flow and two on the conditionality uh, i think it's both it's uh, in a sense it's a game changer because it, it installs this uh, this link for the very first time and uh, and the court has then uh, uh, reinforce this in a sense but two i think uh, if i were the commission i'd be very very cautious uh, when implementing this for the very first time because you can be almost certain that this uh, will will also end up then well, well for, big sums will be involved and two there is still the court and it, uh, there will be a legal review perhaps of the first time uh, the commission has, uh, has then made use of this mechanism so Yes, it will be also, in a sense, probably a slow tool and perhaps not so uh, overwhelmingly impressive as uh, everybody would expect at the first time. But the thing is, it, the direction is, is, uh, is, is there, it, will, uh, it moves forward, but it will not be as fast probably as many will hope. <laughs> so Thanks. Thank you. For the expectation management as well. And on to you, Mrs. Grabasco. Go ahead. Um, so maybe I'll start with, with the second, so conditionality, I think linking it with other uh, aspects so this kind of pro-russian approach taken by the by the hungary I, I first of all it's going to be easier in case of hungary than in case of poland that's my first observation so linking this with with this pro-russian approach by um, by presented by orban which can bring some political isolation as was said uh, before and together with possible article 7 decisions based exactly because of the isolation based on, on the isolation the fact that, that the poland may not support hungary anymore i think that creates some sort of new standard and that can be a, a game changer altogether from the legal perspective i can imagine making this case for the rule of law conditionality can take no longer than one month i think it can be done you know before may or before the this uh, hearing on article 7 uh, against um, uh, hungary so i think it's doable it's possible uh, the question is whether the the, the the environment will be um ready for that when it comes to the recovery fund the first question um i i may yeah i may speak about the polish case which was already mentioned on many occasions there are many elements that can all together put into a, a standard of the judicial independence which is right now broken in in poland and this is the, the threshold that can green light the, the the recovery fund at the moment it's, it's not uh, it's not the case but what what is important is not only that those drafts of legislation are sus still pending in, in the parliament but the, the crucial is how the internal um climate in the government looks like because the minister of justice who is very eu skeptical he's the one whose votes are needed you know for the government to remain um, in, in in power so they cannot just you know quash the disciplinary chamber because they lose they lose majority in in, in the parliament so so he, this decision his position will be absolutely decisive in in this in this in this process and decision taken on the domestic level thank you I have uh, the tradition now to have a small round at the end before we stop, and it's just to, um, well, have a bit more dreams or wishful thinking in the EU bubble, which is often a bit difficult. So maybe to go back to the main topic of our discussion today, which was also the French Council presidency, maybe a very simple question that you can answer in a word or a sentence and not more is, 
what would you consider a success for the French Council presidency when it comes to rule of law? Can be, of course, very, you know, small success and, of course, more ambitious. Um, maybe I'll start with you, Barbara, again, as you were just speaking. When you were uh, asking, I thought that I exactly about my, my um, reply regarding conditionality. I mean, using the momentum that Hungary is isolated might be translated into success. It depends how, um, what is the political will of the member states. Thank you. Um, Mrs. Del bosco -Fien. I really think the hearing on the 30th of May, maintaining this hearing would be a success. I think that, as you said, um, or somebody said at the very beginning, I, I think it's Mrs. Moros, um, the, the presidency, French presidency, uh, looked upon all of this a bit in a general mood. We have a lot of other, there were supposed, some of them was, were cancelled, in fact, but there were supposed to be a few events on rule of law, and, and I was really afraid that would be a bit diluting the, the main purpose. Um, we need a serious hearing. Thank you. And Mr. Kessner. I think they, uh, the idea that success is to, to, to show that the union is taking this serious, you know, this debate about fundamental values and no presidency is alone. Uh, they will be followed by others. And the important uh, element is political continuity in this. Thank you. Thank you. I think these are important keywords at the end. So this is the time to say thank you to the speakers for taking time on a Monday. And even if you were ill as well, Mrs. Demboskoff, thanks for joining. Thanks for the participants for the really good questions and also to uh, still have interest in our rule of law. I know it's not the main issues we're facing at the moment, uh, so, but I still thought it was really important. And also, of course, on uh, the cooperation with Institut Montaigne to Paul who organized this in Sicilia. Just as I mentioned, uh, there will be an elections monitor on Hungary next Monday at the same time at the EPC. So if you want to join to analyze the results of the Hungarian election, please just dial in. You should get the invitation. On that note, thanks so much and have a lovely rest of the week. Bye.